think it's nine o'clock, so I can get going. Hi, my name's Melis Howard. I'm an architect uh, and a director of Archeo Architects. Um, I'm going to be reading you a bedtime story as part of the Architecture Foundation 100 Day Studio. And uh, a little bit why I've chosen the book, or the two books that I'm going to be reading. I'm going to read you uh, an extract from The Making of Home by Judith Flanders. And then to finish, because I am an expert storyteller, I'm going to read one of my children's favourites, Good Night Room Moon, which is also on the theme of kind of mundane domesticity and the kind of minutiae of life. So, um, I chose this book, The Making of Home, because uh, I'm an architect really interested in home. I'm really um, keen to discover the kind of history of how the particularities of the home through history emerged. And I think what this book taught me when I read it is it's a very recent history, actually. And uh, also very conscious that we're all perhaps more familiar than ever with the inside of our home and perhaps also struggling a little with the concept of privacy at home or the lack of, let's say. So the chapter I wanted to read from is called A Room of One's Own and it deals with among subjects of privacy at home, the uh, history of the bed, the toilet and with a finale on the uh, invention of the corridor. So if you're all sitting comfortably, I will begin. So from chapter two of The Making of Home by Judith Flanders. In the summer of 1978, a helicopter carrying a party of geologists across Siberia hovered over the taiga near the Mongolian border, looking for a place to land. There, almost 250 kilometers from the nearest village in a supposedly entirely uninhabited region, the pilot saw that the most domestic of sites, a kitchen garden. The scientists decided it was worth investigation and landed. After walking five kilometers up a narrow path, they came to two wooden planked storage sheds on stilts, stuffed full of potatoes in birch bark sacks. Continuing, they reached a yard piled up on all sides with tiger rubbish, bark, poles, planks. And at the center of the yard was a hut Although they thought it barely worthy of the name, weather stained black with a single window the size of my backpack pocket, it was a ramshackle and altogether not much more than a burrow, a low soot blackened log kennel. And inside the hut's single room could be crossed in seven steps in one direction and five in the other. It held just one item of furniture, an axe hewn table. The floor was covered in, with a layer of tamped down potato peelings and crushed pine nut shells for insulation. But even so, the room was as cold as a cellar, heated by a tiny fire and lit at night by a single rush light. This kennel was the home of five members of the Likov family. Karp Likov and his wife Akulina were old believers, a 17th century Russian Orthodox sect. After the 1917 revolution, persecution led many old believers to relocate abroad. Large communities survived in Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the USA and many smaller ones elsewhere. The largest group, however, was and still is in Siberia. And in the 1930s, during the Stalinist terror, Likov's brother was murdered and Likov fled the tiger with his wife and two small children. Two more children were born subsequently and by 1978, when the geologists stumbled across them, the surviving members had lived in isolation for nearly half a century. Perhaps how we all feel. Uh, after 2020. Five people living in one room with no sanitation, lit and warmed by firelight, cramped, musty and indescribably filthy. Although the geologists failed to recognise, what they were seeing here were not conditions of unimaginable harshness, but the ordinary conditions of their own history and ours. A world where every aspect of life was lived in sight of others, where privacy was not only not desired, but almost unknown. For most of human history, houses have not been private spaces, nor have they had within them more private spaces belonging to specific residents, nor spaces used by all the residents in turn for entirely private functions. The author goes on to give a bit more backstory and we'll pick up here. 
We are so habituated to the standard types of housing that emerged with industrialization and urbanization that we have been all but blinded to what went before. We remember the scant number of great halls of the medieval nobility overlooking the reality that this was less than 1% of what existed at the time. Similarly, the surviving Tudor great houses or gracious colonial governor's mansions have wiped from our minds the vanished habitations of everyone else. While the terraced townscapes that began to appear in Britain in the 18th century created a false history in which everyone lived, more or less as we do today. And thus, centuries of hugger-mugger, cheek-by-jowl living, which almost everyone experienced and expected, have vanished from common knowledge. Yet without knowing how people lived, it can be difficult to understand why they acted as they did. It's only when we know what the physical circumstances people lived in were like that we can appreciate how changes to those circumstances reflected changed ideas and expectations. So again, I'm going to skip through a few pages um, to pick up on how the idea of privacy in domesticity emerged. The idea of privacy came slowly and to different segments of each population at different times, in both house and home countries. It was in the 17th century in France that concepts of privacy around lavatories first appear. The French kings had performed their lavatorial functions in public as they had every other aspect of their daily life until 19, sorry, 1684, when Louis XIV had a curtain put around his clothes stool. And on that note, I'm gonna have a drink. Cheers. Mm. Yet yeah, even now, the notion that this was a private act was still incomplete. A few decades later, one of the sons of Madame de Montespan, the king's mistress, proposed moving a water closet into a separate building entirely. The king's response was terse, worthless idea, useless. And yet even a curtain had created more privacy than the bulk of the population, living five or six in one or two rooms, could ever imagine. The relatively new urban middle-class housing in the Netherlands sometimes had a small area of one room closed off to form a cupboard that contained a bench with a hole in it over a cesspool. Delightful. More often, the Dutch used portable closed stools which were located throughout the house or sat next to the bed as they did in England. This was not simply a consequence of living in small spaces. It was a state of mind. Royalty had long expected the elite to attend their levies, literally rising from bed. Less formal moments were still public by modern standards. Madame de Maintenon, the wife of Louis XIV, undressed and slept in the room where the king and his ministers were meeting. The aristocracy's ceremonial occasions were no less public. In 1710, the Duke de Lyons and his wife were, as a matter of fact, received formal visits, paid to congratulate them on their marriage from their bed. The beds of the great were part of the architectural presentation of their houses. Ham House on the outskirts of London was one of England's most forward-looking architectural and decorative projects. In the 1650s, the main withdrawing room where guests congregated after dinner held a large bed and a suite of furniture, two armchairs and ten folding chairs to match the bed's embroidered hangings. The bed was thus decoratively as much part of the room as the chairs the guests sat on. In aristocratic households in both France and Italy until the middle of the 18th century, a parade bedroom was a reception room that had an alcove with a bed separated from the rest of the room by a railing. The area on the reception room side of the railing was called the Ruelle, or Corsello, the little street, indicating that this was the side where visitors were received. Going on to talk, the author goes on to talk about this um, move towards a privacy again. The major conceptual leap that had been made was not a matter of the number of rooms in a house, it was rather one of living in a new fashion, where daily activities were separated by function, eating and sleeping or cooking and washing, or by gender, boys and girls or quality, masters and servants, or generation, parents and children. And each separate function or gender or quality or generation was given its own special place. This idea is now seen as so normal, it's hard to remember that things were ever organised differently. But it was the 15th century before even a small gesture was made towards this idea in some parts of the world. 
In Renaissance Italy, some of the new city-states saw city palazzi built around courtyards in which rooms were situated together by use, dining and public reception rooms on one side, private reception rooms, a gallery and a library facing them, with, in the linking wings, more private family rooms facing a service wing. In the first half of the 16th century, further isolated examples among the great appeared sporadically. The Chateau de Chambord on the Loire was designed by an Italian architect with four self-contained apartments of four rooms each, one large room for receiving, two smaller ones for more private times, and a closet for the most private. This became French domestic arrangement until the 19th century. But even in the largest houses, the architecture made privacy in modern terms impossible. Rooms were laid out on enfilade, a series of rooms, each opening out of the next, their doors positioned so that they created a grand perspective line of rooms stretching away as far as the awed visitor's eyes could see. Visually, these vistas were a physical expression of the extent of their owner's wealth and power. Practicality was another matter, and the enfilade forced intimacy every much as bit as the labourer's one-room house. To get to the last room in an enfilade, it was necessary to proceed through all the intervening rooms, regardless of who was present in each or what they might be doing. As the Italian playwright Pierre Jacopo Martello asked crossly, what by God is the purpose of those endless succession of rooms where one might come across anyone bouncing along in front of them, even when on an errand of some urgent need? The order of rooms along an enfilade was generally antechamber, salon, bedroom, cabinet, and finally closet. And so privacy could be achieved only by location. As visitors progressed along the enfilade, each room became restricted to fewer and fewer visitors, indicating greater privacy and also an ever more privileged status for those allowed access through the sequence and even more to the room's users. The person who occupied the final room was usually the head of the household. Don't mind me. Um, even when apartments, groups, or three or four linked rooms, as in the Chateau de Chambord, were created for family or personal use, entrances and exits were still via an enfilade, providing no way of maintaining privacy for the room's inhabitants. That the desire for privacy had now arrived in many places is indisputable. The desire was there, but it was the ability to achieve it that was for the moment lacking. In the 17th century, the Dutch created small privacies through changes in behaviour at home, rather than changes to the architecture of their terraced houses. Visitors were expected to remove their shoes, not on entering the downstairs rooms, but on going upstairs. It was a marker that indicated where the private area of the house lay. Civic legislation, too, required that the householders wash the pavements directly in front of their houses that border between public, dirty, and familial, clean, but it was in England that the modern way of shaping domestic privacy in houses, great and small, appeared. From the early Tudor period, buildings, builders and designers had worked on the configurations of buildings to produce the desired results. Initially, the staircase was thought to be the architectural element that held the key. Staircases were built in some houses to run directly from the ground floor to an upper floor without access to any intervening floors, often as a method of defence to protect areas of the house from outsiders, or to protect the rooms that contained the house's valuables, where certain rooms could only be reached by certain people. Soon, stairs were built to create a sense of privacy on the same principle of limiting access, joining one room directly to another, the Lord's bedroom to his valets, or running from one room to an exit. The apartments that Edward Stafford, Duke of Buckingham, created at Thornbury Castle, not far from Bristol, between 1507 and 1521, had stairs leading from his chamber to a privy garden to which there was no other access. The most successful and enduring of these explorations of how stairs might create or enhance privacy was the duplication of staircases to confine different types of people to different areas of the house. Back stairs for servants were soon a commonplace in large houses, but staircases were inflexible. Once the house was built, the stairs could not be altered without enormous structural upheaval. The development that did the most to enable domestic privacy emerged paradoxically from the adaptation of an architectural feature that had appeared in buildings that represented the ultimate in communal living, the medieval monastery. 
monastic buildings laid out in cloisters with arcades around the four sides of an internal courtyard, giving independent access to individual rooms. Architects in the early Tudor period experimented with the idea, adopting the principle but shaping it for use on the inside of a domestic building rather than the outside of an ecclesiastical one. <clears throat> the result was the corridor. The first corridor was designed in 1597 by the architect John Thorpe for a house in Chelsea, and its novelty was made abundantly clear by the elaborate circumlocation needed to describe it to contemporaries. A long entrance running through the entire house. In fact, the word corridor derives from the Italian, where it meant an arcade-like walkway between two buildings. The English initially used the architecturally less precise term passage, and only in the 18th century adopting the Italian word to mean an interior connecting route. The sheer originality of the idea and the necessity for a total reconstruction of the house's layout should have meant its adoption was slow. Instead, a bare 25 years later, an English diplomat dismissed European enfilades as though he'd only ever known corridors. The former, he wrote, <clears throat> put an intolerable servitude upon all the chambers, save the innermost, while their raison d'etre, the perspective vista, destroyed the privacy he now automatically expected, so that a stranger might view all our furniture at one sight. In his eyes, a desirable house was no longer designated as a hierarchical series of public spaces, but as a discrete set of private ones. And when the amateur Sir Roger Pratt designed Coleshill House in Berkshire with corridors in the 1650s, he did so, he said, in order to separate family from servants as well as family members from each other. By the 19th century, even those like the designer and socialist writer William Morris, who longed to return to the medieval past, never questioned the post-Tudor layout of contemporary houses. Morris and his friend, architect friend Philip Webb planned Morris's first home, the Red House, as a return to what they knew of the style of living in the Middle Ages. But their medievalism was entirely confined to the decor, while the house's layout could have been taken from a textbook of Victorian domestic segregation. Here was no great hall for all and sundry. Instead, the rooms rarely interconnected, with most rooms having one entrance only. And when, later in life, Morris bought the 16th century Kelmscott Manor, he commented on the peculiarity of living in a house without corridors. And to conclude, Privacy was now built into the fabric of the building and into the fabric of the residents' minds. So there we go. Hopefully that sent you all to sleep. But in case it hasn't, and you really um, want something a bit like a children's lullaby, or in fact a children's story, I'm going to read uh, Good Night Moon by Margaret Wise Brown with pictures by Clement Hurd. It's an absolute classic and... I think it's beautiful and I enjoy the kind of um, minutiae and sort of mundanity of the internal domestic spaces. That's my justification for reading it. I just think it's a beautiful good night story. So, and I'm going to hold up the pictures for all to see. This is called Good Night Moon. In the great green room, there was a telephone and a red balloon and a picture of the cow jumping over the moon and three little bears were sitting on chairs and two little kittens and a pair of mittens and a little toy house and a young mouse and a comb and a brush and a bowl full of mush and a quiet old lady who was whispering hush good night room Good night, moon. Good night, cow jumping over the moon. Good night, light and the red balloon. Good night, bears. Good night, chairs. Good night, kittens. And good night, mittens. Good night, clocks. And good night, socks. Good night, little house. And good night, mouse. Good night comb and good night brush. Good night nobody and good night mush. And good night to the old lady whispering hush. Good night stars.
Good night, air. Good night, noises everywhere. Thank you.